Hi, everyone. My name is Eddie Lowe, and it's so good to be with you. I'm currently a product manager at Coinbase. And um, previously, before I joined Coinbase, I had been at Google for six years, where I was most recently a product manager there as well. And um, I'm really excited to be with you all today. Um, something that I've been sort of digesting and going through these last couple months is how to work and product manage effectively in a remote first world. And that's sort of my topic today and what I wanted to make sure that um, I was able to share. And what a remote first world means um, is essentially companies that are saying, well, we're gonna scale back our in-office footprint and help people sort of transition to working from home permanently or you know, 90 plus percent of the time. Um, and the goal of this talk is to really share some tools and stories around how I found um, good ways to go about product managing virtual teams. And I'll talk a little bit about sort of my story and my background about how I've been working with remote teams in the past and how I've sort of transitioned from, um, from working completely in person and, and joining a brand new company remotely. Um, without even meeting anybody and sort of being effective product manager there. And what I hope that you all can get out of this talk is really a couple of tools that will allow you as product managers to be just as effective and have maybe like one or two cool things that you can try with your product teams um, as you uh, build those relationships from a virtual basis. So what I wanted to go into first a little bit was just my background and my story from where I was at Google. And uh, when I joined Google, I started off as a program manager and then I moved into technical program management. And both traditionally those roles support product and engineering teams. Um, but I think there's a lot of overlapping skills that there are from, product man or from program management to product management. For example, a lot of TPMs will be script masters or help product teams really make sure that they're delivering on time. And so actually it was my first experience into product when I joined, when I, when I was a TPM at YouTube. And while I was there, I started a um, PM rotation. What that means is how do you turn from any other ladder, any other job ladder and change to the product management ladder. And at Google, there is a program where, you know, you have to find a team, you're on the team for six months, performing the role of a PM. And then after that, you can get recommended to do the product management interviews. And so while I was at YouTube um, as the TPM, I, I got to work on this really cool feature called Blur Faces. And what Blur Faces does, you can see a little demo here, is it, it allows a user, a creator, to automatically blur, identify and blur faces throughout the video itself. And this was born out of a necessity from a group, a human rights order, witness.org, where uh, they wanted citizen journalists to feel safe about taking videos at protests, but making sure that the people in their videos, their faces were anonymous. And uh, one of the, the nice things about this product and this feature was you were able to talk directly to users themselves. You were able to see you know, what are the struggles that they're having. And for example, in this case, it was a video that they needed to take, upload it, uploading it to another program, finding faces, blurring them out, finding that face again, blurring it out again. It was very tedious and it didn't make for great ways to protect users' privacy. And so um, this feature does this all automatically in just one swoop throughout the entire video. And what I really, like I said, enjoyed about it was just being able to directly work with those engineers, directly work with a product manager who was, uh, who was spearheading the effort, and then talking to users and helping make sure that the value that we're providing to the users is well communicated back to the engineering team. So after that you know, experience, I, I moved from that, that team to another privacy team within Google where uh, I started doing my own PM rotation. And um, from there, I, you know, privacy had been a really hot topic a couple years ago and still is today. Um, and so what the strategy for the company was, well, let's open a product engineer, uh, a privacy engineering group out in Europe. And they chose Munich, Germany. And so 
for me as a product manager, I had to travel back and forth from San Francisco to Germany often. And that's because there was a team who was based out of there. And so while I was going and flying these miles, I would be only going maybe once a quarter. Um, and you could imagine, especially if you're working with a group of people and you're trying to build something together, you know, seeing each other in person once a quarter is great, but a little tough. And even when there's a time difference, so when San Francisco was waking up for the morning, Munich was starting to shut down their computers. And so there would be a lot of asynchronous just tasks that we would have to figure out how to best hand things off, how to communicate correctly, how to even deal with the even office politics of things, the relationships that were going on that were happening while the other half of the world was asleep. And so, um, you know, working with this team provided, I think, the right training ground for me, at least, to understand, well, how do you best work with a remote team and Actually, now that I've joined a company that I haven't even met anyone yet um, at Coinbase, um, I think that experience too has allowed me to sort of build good teams and build good dynamics um, within a virtual space. Specifically in Munich, I would say there were a lot, and because this was a new group that was just forming, there were a lot of young engineers fresh out of college. Um, and when we had those uh, young engineers join, everyone was really excited to, to start you know, building something great and solving all of the user problems. And um, I think there, that, that, that's the right attitude to have, but to be able to do that effectively, you need to be able to collaborate not only with your own engineering team, but your stakeholders and your partners, including product and UX and design. So, um, you know, while I was there, I got great experience just sort of working with these young engineers. And, and there's, a, there's a common question that I would always be asked, which I'll get to in a second, but I did want to share something that I get asked from friends around me and not, not necessarily at Google is, do they have their own beer at the Munich Google office? And the answer is yes, they brew their own, including um, <laughs> everything at Google is homebrewed, including their beer, including their internal tools. It's actually been a, it's been a fun transition for me outside of the Google ecosystem, because now that I'm in the startup world, I'm learning all these tools that everyone knows about, like Slack, and, and I'm still in my own, like, how do I use this tool? In any case, the common question that I get asked from younger engineers, um, especially joining you know, a company or a team for the first time, is what is it again that you do? As a product manager, what do you do? And so um, I would say from an engineer's perspective, that's a good question to ask. You know, why do they need somebody, someone else to tell them, all right, this is what we should build. This is how we should build it. Um, this is what, you know, our users are saying about our product. Why would they need someone to tell them that when they can just ask the user themselves or work with a, you know, a designer or UX themselves, do the research themselves? Um, I think there's, there's three things that I would answer to what do I do, and I'll dive into each of those three with, with us today, and I hope actually by me explaining some of these concepts, you'll be able to take away too a little bit more conceptually, you know, what is the role of a product manager, but also how do we apply those things and add value to our teams. So one of the first things that I say that I do is tell stories, whether it's telling a user story or telling my own story as I am here. Um, I think a good product manager has to be able to effectively communicate and tell those pain points and stories to stakeholders and their engineering team. Not just talking to one or two users, but understanding what is going on in the industry, what is going on within the entire user base and representing that to an engineer. Driving consensus. So what, what else do I do? I drive consensus on a daily basis. How do you sort of get everyone to agree that, yes, this is the next thing that we should put on our roadmap. This is the next thing that we should take on. Yes, to upper level management. Like this is the, this is the strategy that we should go with. Or if there's pushback, you know, how do you incorporate the, the feedback from the privacy team or the legal team? Um, and really understanding, you know, how do we move forward in a direction that most people are happy and the last thing that I would say a product manager, a good product manager would do is inspire confidence. Inspiring confidence to me 
you know, actually, I'm sure that you all have seen leaders in your space, in your world, and in, in, in our industries that you're like, oh, yeah, I want to be like that, that, that PM, that CEO. Um, so inspiring confidence not only means that, you know, you are able to sort of lead with example and lead well, but also to show the stakeholders that you have that your team is the best that, that is there to, to solve this problem that your team is a very capable team of understanding like what are the users talking about and what the solution is as well as you know any like i was alluding to on the consensus piece any cross collaborative stakeholders who need their their own meet, needs met how can you make sure that they're brought along and they feel confident that you are having their interests in your own uh, roadmap so I'll go into each of one of these uh, pieces real quick and how sort of uh, I think there's some tools that we all can take away from in order to get to these three points. So the first one is um, around uh, telling stories. And it's, <clears throat> it's, it's hard not to just, um, not to just connect with people, uh, I think in person, but also, you know, now that we have this layer of this, TV screen, for lack of a better word, between us, um, I would say it's, it's even harder now to connect virtually. Uh, and it's not just about, you know, having a lot of FaceTime with people. It's not just about making sure that you're checking in with meetings. Um, I would say telling stories is a good way of, of understanding, one, how do you figure out the ways of connecting with someone that's, that you're not working with directly? And then two, how do you work with a user that you are that you don't have any visibility into, that you can't see? Um, and so, what I want to emphasize here is that it's not just sort of the team itself. It's not just the users itself. It's a lot of ways that we have to incorporate these actors, these players, into our stories. And I think the big thing that I've noticed, especially when it comes to you know remote first environments, is it's very easy for things to get lost in translation. Specific, specifically, when I was working with that team in Munich, um, yes, there were cultural barriers, there were communication style differences. And so when you say, when you say one thing, it could be interpreted as a completely different way in another time zone, in another culture. Quick example of that was, you know, one time, uh, our, our director said, okay, well, why don't you put together a plan to sort of have an intake process? And that's a pretty vague ask and, you know, even intake process, those two words it's on its own can be interpreted in many different ways. Um, and sort of when, when another team heard that, when the, other, when, when the team that was in Germany heard that, they ran with, you know, they, they ran with the process, they, you know, put together a whole squad and when we confirmed back with the director, is this what you were looking for? It turned out, no, that wasn't active. Intake and process, those were two different things for him than how everyone interpreted it. And that caused a lot of friction among the teams. I think, you know, as we were trying to understand each other's working styles, as we were trying to communicate as asynchronously across time zones, uh, tone, came off in emails and written communication in different ways than you would, than, than you would if you were speaking in person. Um, but the lag between the time it would be that we could send the information and get the information was so different because it, it, um, it'll, it didn't allow us to really gel because there would be side conversations or developments that would happen during the day that you wouldn't have necessarily had insights into. And so there's a lot that I think that can be lost in translation, especially when it comes to written communication. And when, when we sort of think about that and how we've overcome that in the past, I would say, you know, it's, we would do offsites, we do team bonding. Yes, we can still do that in, in our remote first worlds. Um, but even more so, I think it's important to remember the human behind the screen. Um, and here's just a quick example of, you know, this was a group that I had worked with. We had done offsites, we had done working uh, sessions together, and that always got us closer and closer. 
And of course, when you had arguments or dis discussions, heated discussions um, that were happening outside of meetings, yeah, they would be over pings, they would be over emails. And I think what was really great about the group that I had been with was you know, we would always remember that there is someone with feelings, with emotions, with a life behind the other end of your email. And so you would take a step back and say, all right, well, how would this be interpreted? How could this be interpreted or misinterpreted? And being more clear about your communication. Um, so that's just sort of, you know, working across different groups, but how about working with your engineering teams directly? And so when I had just joined, when I joined at Coinbase, um, yeah, it was daunting. I didn't know anybody, didn't know anyone about who to trust about, you know, who, who is sort of, you know, pulling me in one direction and pulling me in the other, who I'm supposed to prioritize, right? Uh, and then, you know, I, I, I joined a engineering team who never had a, a full PM, full time PM. And so how do you sort of build that trust with them? And one tool that I really love to use when I join new product teams and new engineering teams, and actually we used this when I first joined the Munich project too, was something called stories. And what this was, was a story that, you know, a 10 minute presentation that you would put together um, and tell the team anything about yourself that is personal enough that you're willing to share. And what I really liked about this, this uh, exercise was not only do you get to see who this person is from their background, their upbringing, but also what makes them tick. So I'll give you an example. Just, you know, um, I, 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 this is one of the slides from my story and I sort of shared, you know, this is what I used to do as an industrial engineer and what I did as a sales engineer. And, you know, one of them was all about getting things to be really efficient and optimizing for work. And there's another screen, there's another picture of me just sort of lounging at work where I, I wasn't challenged in my first role. And so, you know, it, it wasn't the right role for me. And by me sort of sharing those things out, um, you get a sense of, you know, what are things that I value? What are things that I like to do? So I like challenging projects. I like to be challenged. And I like, you know, efficiency op and optimiza optimizing for, you know, very uh, great workflows or work pads. And um, by sort of sharing that, and this is just one slide of many, right? Um, but by sharing that amongst your team, they get a sense of, okay, well, cool, this person is sort of busy. It's a talking point. Um, and then it also just like allows you as someone behind a computer screen to be a little more humanized. Um, it, it, it builds that trust, it builds that empathy of what makes you tick and what makes you who you are today. So that's one, one tool that I'd like to sort of share in, in telling stories, literally an exercise called stories. Okay, um, back to sort of this idea of what is it that you do? I think the, the, uh, the next one is driving consensus and driving consensus around many different aspects of products. So whether it's, you know, this is what we should build next. This is our mission. This is our vision for the team um, and convincing people like this is where I think our product should move forward. What I want to start off with is, and, and I have a tool that I think is actually really effective in um, building and driving that consensus, especially when it comes to a newer engineering team. I think it's really important for engineers, as well as your, your stakeholders, but specifically the engineers that are on your team, to understand what is it that they're building, why they're building it, and be bought into that vision that you as a product manager have set up. And there's a great tool that I'll talk about here, which is the design sprint. And you may have heard of it, you may not, and if you haven't, I'll go into sort of what that is. Um, that is that enables a team of very diverse group of people, including stakeholders, to come together and say, yes, this is our north, this is going to be our north star, this is what we're going to build toward in the next six to 12 months. And I would actually say that design sprints are really fun to do in person. Um, and I kind of want to give some hints on how to do this in a virtual remote first world. So if you're not familiar with the design sprint, um, this is sort of the product. Uh, life cycle, product development life cycle that you typically probably have seen, 
where you're going from ideation to design to launch to learn. And I put, you know, rough estimates, and these are these two weeks represent sprint cycles. Um, and, and the idea here is that it takes a quarter or two maybe to ship a product out the door, to be able to launch a feature, de depending on the velocity of your team, but you know, to get everyone together to buy in and understand how do you ideate, design, launch, and then iterate from that. So the goal of a design sprint is that it actually is to cut down this time uh, to just this ideation and learning cycle and really understanding how do you come up with ideas quickly and validate them so that you know this is the right way to move forward versus before, yes, you'd idea, you'd still design and, and you, know, you might put something on the market and then see how users respond to it with A-B tests or you know, checking true metrics around that. But the idea here is how do you skip some of that time that it takes to build and time that it takes to learn, uh, get those metrics in, and just do it real quick within a week. That's a typical design sprint timeline. So a design sprint. The idea is to, to expand and contract to tackle big problems quickly um, and really to skip those cycles of, of development and get everybody involved, not just the engineering team, not just the design team, but everyone who might be a stakeholder to have a voice and get them involved with this process. And I'll quickly go over some of these steps in a design sprint. So the first thing is really understanding um, what the user pain points are. And once you've, and, and I'll go over into specifics on how you can do this, but one of the tools is doing lightning talks and having different stakeholders come in and tell us, you know, what are users' pain points? What are we hearing on the ground? Um, and then from there, so expanding and then contracting to define, okay, exactly what is the problem that we want to solve versus, you know, there's so many that you can potentially go down, so many paths you can go down. Let's zoom back in and define exactly what that one problem is. Then going back out a little bit, okay, what are so now all these, now that we have this one problem, what are all the different ways that we potentially could solve for that problem? So you can ideate with solutions. And again, I'll go into sort of what, what that looks like. And from there, once you've gotten a big group of, of ideas coming together and getting that consensus to decide, all right, this is the path that we can now move down. This is the design that we can at least move forward a little bit with. And the last step there is prototype. So going back out and coming together with a, a design, a prototype that you can test out with a bunch of different users and then zooming back in to validate, all right, this is how we want to attempt to build a product solution. So all of this happens within five days, five business days in a week. And it's a day long session every day. And we have sprint masters who help facilitate this. And um, I'll go into sort of what each of these steps look like. So for this understanding point, you know, I mentioned lightning talks. And lightning talks are these 15 minute quick talks about specific topics. And as um, as those lighting talks happen, everyone who's participating in the design sprint is writing post-it notes that start with HMW, as you can see there. How might we? The idea is how might we solve this user issue, this user problem uh, that we're hearing in the lightning talk. And so when you're doing these lightning talks, you know, you want to curate experts. So whether it's people who have done user research, people who are actual users themselves, who have industry knowledge, and each of them will bring a different perspective. And every time that perspective is brought, you write down, hey, how might we? Because we're hearing inefficiencies in their life, or we're hearing about their pain points. And so you're talking about very specific areas. And so as, as those speakers are going, you're just writing down as much as you can. And you also want to invite a diverse group of teammates. Invite everyone, the engineers, the product managers, the designers, the program managers, Everyone who supports the team, and they're all thinking from their own perspective, how might we solve for X? And the goal of after, after you sort of do this exercise um, and, and those lightning talks, uh, all the post-its go up and you start clustering them into what are the themes that people have heard. And there's a dot voting exercise. So people vote on what they think is the most important, how might we to tackle. And the idea here is that we're aligning everyone to those, those themes, those issues, 
that allows everyone to sort of say, okay, let's take a step back. Do we all understand what problem we're trying to solve? For? What are the big issues? What are the big themes to go from? And the best part of that is not only did everyone participate in that exercise, but now everyone is aligned with the consensus of, yes, I understand why we need to go in this direction. Okay, so that's the, um, that's the ID8 stage. I'm sorry, that's the, uh, uh, the understand stage. The ID8 stage is really um, this fun phase of really quickly throwing out ideas, really quickly generating ideas of what I'm supposed to, what we can do to solve for that one big theme, that one big, big problem that we all decided in the previous step that we're going to tackle. And so what I would, what I would um, encourage in this stage, and you can read into what crazy eights do exactly, but you, know, you fold a piece of paper and uh, into eight squares, and the idea is you draw quickly and you draw a lot. You draw quantity over quality, and there's no bad ideas. You just want to get everything that you can, the first thing that comes to mind. The idea is that, you know, sometimes the simplest solution is the best solution. And, the, and, and after that, you get feedback. The, 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 the journeys that you put together or the ideas that you put together are critiqued, are passed around, and they're questioned by your peers. And that's the idea. You're getting quick feedback and consensus. Oh, yeah, I didn't think about that. My colleague, my, my teammate, just remembered or reminded me how I can address this, this problem at hand. And the last step here is really to prototype. And this is where a designer might come in and help create mocks or create actual, you know, something that you can play with on your phone or app. Um, and from there, you're, you're taking that and having a user researcher or people within this design sprint sitting down with users, interviewing them. Does this make sense? Would this solve for a problem that you might have? And helping them really uh, get good data about this idea. And then from that step, you're really honing in really carefully on what is a potential solution. So that's a design sprint in a nutshell. The trick to doing this all remotely <laughs> is virtual whiteboards. They're your friend, and there's a product that I have used in Jamboard where it's a it's it's a physical it's a physical whiteboard that you could get as well that, that you can write on digitally. But there's also just an app that you can use from your web browser. And everything that I talked about, from post-its to crazy eights that are pictures that you're drawing on your piece of paper can more or less be replicated, not in the completest and most collaborative sense, but in an effective enough way, and this is a, from a design sprint that you know, I've done recently, um, that you can put together uh, enough space where those ideas and that discussion can be facilitated. So I highly recommend looking into just sort of how do you collaborate with a group of new people, especially, gaining consensus through a design sprint and then using these virtual tools to help you. Now, a design sprint does not always mean product design, and it doesn't have to be that full five days. In fact, tomorrow I'm doing a mini design sprint with my team. It's only gonna be two hours, and I'm only gonna do that first phase, which is the uh, lightning talks, how might we's, and crazy eights. And how, well, the questions that we're gonna answer can vary. So one of my goals tomorrow will be, how do we develop product strategy? And the outcome will be consensus. It will be people coming together and agreeing that this is where we want to move next. Another goal could be product metrics. I've seen people do design sprints on metrics. And again, the outcome is consensus. The one that I had done with the Munich team, because they didn't feel like they were part of our vision, mission, and strategy, they were brand new. Well, let's redefine that. Let's define it together. What is the product vision? And again, the outcome is consensus. And this is all, you know, these are precursors to another exercise that you could do, for example, doing user journey mapping or with metrics, you know, before you actually go into the data and define it. These are high level things, but again, it drives everyone toward that same point. Okay, and the last thing that I wanna leave us with is on the what do you do piece is inspiring confidence. Inspiring confidence, I think, um, can take many different shapes and forms, and I don't think necessarily it, it, it has to be, you know, you have to be a CEO to inspire confidence, or you have to be a leader in your industry to inspire confidence. Um, inspiring confidence within teams and within your product area 
and within the user space is so important as well. And so how do product, product managers inspire comments? You can do it through your team, through your stakeholders, through your users. From a team's perspective, and this is a term that I've really embraced within the last couple of years, especially psychological safety. So building a space where anyone on the team can feel safe to make mistakes, to speak up, and really importantly, to have each other's backs when you're not together. That's the biggest dynamic note that I'm noticing that's different with this remote first world. You don't know what's, what are the side conversations that are happening. You know, usually you'd be able to pull someone aside and say, hey, let's talk about this. Let's bring in Eddie. Let's bring in someone else. Um, those conversations are happening asynchronously or just in private now. And you know, when you're not together to be able to collaborate, to be able to bounce ideas off each other, it's important to have each other's backs and also make sure that you feel like that team that you've created is in a safe space to be able to share feedback openly and honestly. For your stakeholders, inspiring confidence, what that means is, you know, knowing the people who are your stakeholders and their priorities. So if you're going into a large meeting and you're trying to get buy-in for your you know, outcome of that design sprint, almost knowing what those people will say before you go into it. It's all about the people. So one strategy could be, well, doing quick pings or asides with each of those stakeholders and saying, hey, this is what I plan on sharing. Let me know your feedback now so that by the time you're actually doing that larger group consensus meeting, everyone, you, you know, everyone is predictable. You know what people are going to say because you've already inspired them to be confident in your ideas by sort of looping them in early and often. The last piece here is you, your users. You know, how do you inspire confidence with your users? By delivering value to them by understanding nuanced pain points and not just you know, saying, well, this moves my team's metric in the right way. Oh, I'm, moving, I'm making more profit for the company this quarter. Um, yes, that's important to chase after, but for your users themselves, are you inspiring confidence that the product that you are managing is moving in the right direction, that they wanna to continue to keep using the product and come back to it? And so inspiring confidence takes many different forms. And I think, especially in, in our in, in our you know, new working environments, all of this can happen. Just kind of bringing this back home, you still have to be careful. Things will be lost in translation. Um, much of this talk, everything that I talked about was about alignment and consensus. It's really harder now with, with, um, with fewer people that you're interacting with on a daily basis. It's really harder now when you can't see the body language of the full body language of people. Um, and so checking in off and building those, those psychological safe, psychologically safe spaces, um, helping people understand, you know, where are you coming from? Where are they coming from? Getting that empathy, not with just your users, not with just your team, not just with your stakeholders, um, and really getting a holistic picture of everyone that you're working with. And with that, that's the end of my, my talk. And I, I hope that that was really informative in just sort of understanding my, my perspective on what I've kind of gone through. Product manager, you know, in a remote first world, and I really hope that the takeaway for folks on the, on, who, are, who are watching is just what are some nuggets that you can take, that you can bring as you join a new team, as you join a new company for the first time and not having known anybody, that one, some of the feelings that you're, that you're experiencing are normal and are shared between other people who are joining from a remote, world, remote first world. Um, but then also, how, what are some tools that you can take to overcome those hurdles? and to build you know, that trust, build those teams in an effective way. Um, and my, I, I left my LinkedIn uh, link there. Feel free to reach out for any questions or comments or follow-ups. Um, but uh, thank you for, for joining and, and I really hope that you had a um, enjoyable and um, interesting experience with this talk. Thanks.